I was going through a heart attack and then my heart stopped for 18 minutes trying to revive me they gave me three defibrillator attempts to finally bring me back and I I came back first rule that you need to understand is you need to love your product I live and breathe for you the most high priced commodities around the world have polarizing smells and tastes and I realize Feeny has that hey entrepreneur I have with me Hansel Vaz, the Feni Dotor of Goa. Hansel, welcome to our podcast. Before we begin, come from Bombay, come from Delhi, come from many land. Come from Bangalore, come from Pune, come from many land. If you're looking out for your favorite Feni brand, try Kajulo, try Kajulo, Feni Amchi Re. Hansel. <laughs> Welcome to our podcast. Thank hey, Anupana, how to? Thank you. Meet Hansel Vaz. He was medically dead for 18 minutes in 2018. Came back to life and resurrected the Feni industry. A geologist by profession, he is now rocking the Feni industry. When it comes to Feni, there's only one name synonymous in the state, and he is taking Feni to the world. Who said life was going to be boring? It was shockingly exciting for me. I mean, uh, not people, not many people get a second chance. I was lucky. Also, I must say that uh, I'm not the only person who was actually uh, involved with the Feni business. I'm just one of the present torchbearers. Uh, there's somebody from your village actually, and he is Valentin Vaz. I mean, the late Valentin Vaz, family friend of ours, and I grew up looking up to him because he used to come over every time, and I would hear stories back then. Something we've been part of the Feni business for a long time, but he's someone I look forward to. I hope. And that as we go future i mean i'll just pass pass on this torch to someone else we're creating this base for a great future so to start off with i think fun fact hansel i was checking up on google and if you search who is the owner of feni oh okay oh really <laughs> mr hansel was his name pops up right so my first question how to own a category and dominate it like you have done you know uh, these are very big words and uh, and when you say dominate i i feel a little intimidated by that because as an entrepreneur you you and i as a person who who came out with you never think about that i think the f- first biggest mistake you make is when you think that you can dominate and you want to dominate i think the first rule that you need to understand is you need to love your product first when i was playing when i was young i was playing sport I was being trained uh, to play play sport, and my coach told me one thing. He said, "If you want to play the game first, you need to first love the game. Number one. The second thing you need to do is learn the rules of the game. If you don't know the rules, you don't know where you stand. You need to draw the rules. Then you need to play that game. Play that game so well that you know your opponents." and you know what the boundaries are then you can adjust your own boundaries and then win the game and that's what it is so so for me it was in the beginning i needed to understand what feni was and do i love it and to be honest i live and breathe feni i mean i it was something that i always did ever since i was a kid i was always involved with feni in some way either tasting it as a young kid notily or i was actually i mean uh, dreaming about it once you understand who your competitors are and it was very easy because in feni there a local spirit you know everyone you know everyone's strengths you know everyone's weaknesses the big advantage i had was i understood what i wanted and what the consumer wanted if you can understand what your consumer wants your games easy what we did was we reestablished the rules what i did was i did something very different i converted the word feni into its constituent elements i broke it down into a beautiful language of colors textures smells tastes and converted it into an allegory that someone like you could understand i had to simplify it because feni when you think about feni you think of any product it is very complicated it's that obscure spirit you heard about it's a spirit that maybe you drink too much it smells maybe it's a spirit that kind of gives you headache you really don't know what it is you're traveling from another part of the world you're traveling from india or even a local person what is this feni people know about whiskey people know about wine people know about vodka but when it comes to feni nobody knows anything and so for me i first loved feni and then i had to simplify what feni meant so breaking it down into this great allegory made me understand what feni was then i could tell the story and what i've done is nothing great i've only told that story on a different level playing field so i think cancel what you said is striking a chord so beautiful because building brands are all about storytelling right we have heard this a lot what's my story what's your story uh, each and every brand has a story. but what you've done is taken a product which is so complicated for a tourist that comes down and of any smells it has a different sort but you've turned a negative into a positive through storytelling we say in brand right keep it simple and sensuous in your case that's kiss what you've done with feni is if you've given it all the six senses right across you know smell taste 
touch with your packaging and if you see casual wear it's it simplifies authenticity in one word talking about playing the game right you've taken a playground which was so local and created playgrounds all over the world right the world is your playground right now how do you take a product that is so local in nature with a gi tag and take it to the world so you know this is very interesting i mean first of all i'm not a mba i've not been to branding school <clears throat> i'm a geologist i spend more time looking under a microscope uh, and holding a glass more than anything else i've just been essentially looking at uh, at rocks that was what i did all my life 10 10 years of the of my life i've been traveling looking at rocks but there's one thing that that really uh, resounded with me was actually the call for identity and one thing i realized when i was traveling so and this is this is actually happened i was on a small island in the middle of the pacific pacific i was in in tonga uh, tonga famous because jona lomu the famous rugby player came from there so i was i was in tonga and i was trying to buy a souvenir from their duty free and they were selling coconut oil great coconut oil nice coconut oil there that they sold was actually in coca cola bottles um with the top of coca cola scratched off maybe with a shell or a, or a coin or something like that and it was sold there everyone was laughing at that product they're like hey what is this thing and and a lot of people picked it up because it looked so poor in packaging and that's when it struck me immediately resounded back to where what was happening in goa we were selling feni back then at 80 rupees in a plastic bottle with some gaudy packaging and something like that it really reflected it it would refer a traveler it would reflect on who we were and what we were by the product we consumed and the product we sold their impression last impression of leaving that country was a plastic bottle of feni and i resolved to change that and, and so one of the things i realized when i was actually there i realized that it's for us indians it's easier to sell foreign brands and local brands i mean my my background is i sell liquor it's easy to sell a johnny walker or 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 a, or a fancy vodka or a fancy gin then to sell a local feni and the same thing applies to everything indian we can sell adidas or a louis vuitton pair of uh, i mean uh, shoes better than a kolapuri chappal and so i had to understand what what is this problem why can't we sell anything indian we can sell foreign cars tvs shoes everything indian products we stumble the first thing i had to understand about what what makes a brand tick was i did this very crazy thing and i mean i actually did it i i spent over i think over a month just going to supermarket after supermarket after supermarket looking at products it could be honey it could be olive oil it could be a packet of chips it could be a packet of uh, a bottle of wine or could be a bottle of whiskey i would be walking down an alley and i would just unconsciously wait for my eye to pick up a product and i say oh this catches my eye let me pick this up i started i started picking them up and taking pictures uh, and trying to understand what made that product catch my eye i did this i did this for almost a month I needed to pick up elements of a product of what makes product explode stand out stand out yeah for you know not just stand out you have to explode. explode yeah you're watching they're walking down the road you're not standing out you're actually exploding into your eyes because it's coming from the side from the side I always kept this side not the conscious side almost unconscious and I picked up products that's the first thing I did you pick up elements everywhere the great part about storytelling is that some people th- overthink it you got to tell a story i was not telling my story i was telling the story of the product the product of feni feni had such a great story to get that great story there is no substitute for one thing that everyone forgets it is research so if there's, if there's one thing that my geology career taught me is this research and there's no research through internet no research through instagram or pinterest and all these things today people insta- uh, do instagram research this is actually ground research you need to put boots on the ground walking up a hill talking to people finding out those intangible stories that you'll never get those experiences and for me it was a repository i kept on building it building it building it and nobody knew what i was doing this is like about 15 years ago people used to find it very funny that a young guy in jeans and shoes would be coming up a hill talking about feni why not slippers and who is this guy and i kept on doing this so i, I worked on research i picked up elements of products that worked uh, that that came out and then i was very conscious of the tonga experience i didn't want a tourist leaving goa thinking picking up a third world product So when Feni had to come out, it had to look better than the best. It should be. It, I wanted it to stand, explode off that bottle shelf. It, I wanted that brand to look international. It could not look Indian. And you know, this is this is about fifteen years ago. And people said, "Why are you doing spending so much money on trying to do fancy packaging?" And again, there was a big big thing because I want to make fancy packaging, but I wanted a Konkani name. So I put Kazulo. Today, everybody wants to use local names. You have Indri, you have Makazai, you have Makadi. You have all these local names coming out. But back then, nobody wanted local names. 
So I put a, a, a local name back then. So I wanted to have a local name with packaging because I was very clear. Feni and the Kazulu had to be an ambassador for the land and people where it comes from. That was it. Interesting. So the bedrock of your success is research. I tell you, a lot Absolutely. of people start off business and a lot of people start off their entrepreneurial ventures by taking the dive without actually having research. And nowadays with a lot of easy research options, chat GPT, you know, simple tools like Google, it's made the world uh, an easy place to start business. Yet 15 years back, you spent a month Right, something that people will get off in a click today. I think the bedrock of your success is research. And many entrepreneurs ignore the fact that, you know, everyone thinks, okay, let me get the product, go into the market, try hundreds of things and then fail and then try again. I think what you've done is you've kind of created a fail proof uh, model I, before you uh, start off. No, see, see, so I'm a very different person. So when it came, so I've, I've done a few things and I, I played badminton and I was not the greatest in badminton, but I was good at badminton. There were always players better than you. If I was great, I would be representing the country, but I was never anywhere, anywhere close to even representing my, my state. I was school level badminton. And there's something that you want to do. I used to hate losing. I used to hate losing. And I used to, I didn't, my parents never saw me play. My friends never saw me play. Because I was so conscious about losing. When I went into college and I went into my, my studies and all, and I uh, went and I, I always wanted to be have that success. And I realized that there's no shortcut to success. You have to do your homework. The more you practice, the more you figure out, you do your homework. Because once you're on that playground, playground. you cannot fail. So what I did was, and I, and I think the biggest mistake a lot of entrepreneurs think is they want to become rich. Fast. They want to make money. They want to sell a brand. I never thought about selling a brand. I never thought I would create such a big brand. I just wanted to create a timeless product. I never said I'm going to create a brand. I want to create a timeless product. The product that is relevant today should be relevant 50 years from now. That is very clear in its packaging, in its form, in its liquid. You need to get those basic elements. You need to understand the product, do your research. You need to understand the product. So it needs to have a proper st structure, which is going to be a great packaging. The packaging should be international. So it's it, it should not be, you're not, not going to be cutting pennies there. The third thing is a liquid inside the product. I had to make sure the liquid is superior to everyone else. Everyone else thinks you can just put a liquid inside. I make my own liquid. I always say I'm not... Uh, I, I'm almost like Netflix. I'm actually making my own content. I'm not buying content. The last part is you need to sell it. That's the toughest part. You can do all your steps prob pro properly. But if you cannot sell it, then it's gone. Because you need to make that money back to fund this whole thing again. And it's that cycle. You realize that cycle. And the faster that cycle turns, the better it is. But the thing is, um, what people forget is that investments. So when you're investing in a product... It could be intellectual investment. It could be a physical investment. It could be investment for the future. And so when people ask me, where are you investing? And are you investing in stocks and this and that? I said, no, I'm investing in my brand. And I've invested in things that I know that will 100% will pay off. Maybe not for me, but maybe for my kids. So very interesting investment, I think, both in terms of time has been your Feni experiences. You've launched the Feni Trail. Yeah. recently which has been a resounding success because it's been covered by ob almost every uh, media channel out there tell us how have you created an experience to supplement the brand experience when i when i started uh, the feni experiences it was very interesting i realized i i realized feni had this beautiful story a story that had never been told and never been told from a local point of view. It was always someone else telling stories. And that's the big problem. When you tell a story, it really depends who's telling that story. What narrative are you taking? So I had to pick up my narrative. I picked up the narrative that this is not Hansel Vaz's story. This is not Kazulo's story. This is Feni's story. story. This is the Feni story. Kazulo will be that brand that is going to take that story forward. Hansel, Hansel Vaz is going to be telling that story of Feni. And I knew I had all this research. I only realized that I had to now create an experience. I, didn't, I never thought of it as an experience. But it was just something that when people came and they listened to my story about Feni and when they saw the insight, because when I give an insight, I'm looking at Feni through a lens of history, through a lens of culture, and through, through a lens of science. Three things. So my professor told me this. If you can explain, when I was studying, when I was studying petrology, so my, my professor said, if you can explain a complex crystalline emplacement of a rock to a fourth standard student, then you're a master at the subject. <laughs> wow. So so I realized if I have to explain Feni to a person, whether it could be a Czechoslovakian, it could be a Tamilian, it could be a Chinese, I don't care. It could be, I, I've done, uh, you have to be able to tell that story. Today I've told a story in Hindi, which is very, very it's, it's my biggest achievement. I've been able to do a Feni <laughs> session in Hindi. I've also done a Feni session in broken French and English. Wow. Yeah. 
because French have come. We've got people from Iceland who have come. We've got people from Japan who have come. We've got people from all over the world coming. And what actually happened? So when I when I first proposed the Feni tasting, uh, people asked me what uh, Feni testing, and I was like, no, it's not testing. It's Feni tasting. They're like tasting. What are you going to taste? I said, you're going to taste Feni. They said you can do that in a spice farm. I said no. I said this is totally different because I realized something very interesting. And the toughest people to convince were actually Goans because we've been drink, drinking drinking yeah. Feni all our lives. We know Feni. What more are you going to tell me? I know about Feni. So I, I, I broke it down very simple. I said, what does a ca- cashew taste like? What does a cashew taste like? So a little sweet. Mm. A little gooey. Gooey, okay. Sweet, gooey. Please remember the flavors. Oh, a little pungent with the smell. Okay. Pungent, gooey, sweet. Sweet. A little messy. That looks like some baby food. Yeah. So, so, so I know because whenever I eat like a, a <laughs> bite into so, a so, cashew, no, no, no. it's always like dripping on me. And, no, no, no. no, no. So, so this is very interesting. For someone who's sitting out out there, who's never seen a cashew, never smelled a cashew fruit, as hearing your description, he's going to say sweet, gooey, messy and pungent. It makes no sense to him. And that's the big problem. It's such an obscure spirit. How do I make someone understand it simply? And so what I had to do, I said I had to give them two things. I had to give them a taste-filled experience but I give them perspective for that taste. So what I did was I opened up one of my distilleries and I essentially, it was it was just a normal distillery. It was a hundred year old distillery. It was nothing. It was all over the place and it was just exactly what it is. So we were not pretentious. We said, okay, this is the story. We're going to tell you that story. And I went from process to process, giving them an insight from A to B to C and took them on a whole journey. And I didn't realize that people are like, wow, they were enthralled by it because they're now traveling through my, my eyes, how I look at Feni, through this whole journey, seeing this, traveling through the whole thing, and then they understand why Feni has smell. Uh, why does Feni have a taste? Why does t- Feni have so much of character? How is this character formed in Feni? And then I, I, I created the cellar, and this was something that I had. So when I was sick, when I came back, I, I had this vision of this big room full of Garafam. And I told you about these investments. I'm always investing, and I was investing in Garafam. Nobody understood why is somebody collecting Garafam. That time, Garafam costed 300, 500 rupees each. Nobody understood why would someone want a garafam and also in large numbers. So I picked How up. How many numbers? I've got now close to about 2,000. Garafam? Yeah, garafam. Wow. So I've got 2,000 garafam, which is the biggest collection from huge ones to small ones to tiny ones. I've got the largest collection in India. Uh, nobody knew what I was doing. And when I was sick and I was recovering, I suddenly had this vision of this room full of bottles and the table in front. I quickly uh, pulled out a envelope and I drew the, the the drawing and I called my mason I said can we build this and it was an old chicken farm that had collapsed we built it and we created this room and that's that's what we call the Beko Dash Garuf Garfoish which is the alley of bottles where you can actually do the tasting that that became my cellar room and then I suddenly realized I need to make money because I've, been, I've invested quite a lot of money in Garafam I've invested quite a, a lot of money in building that room and I didn't need to do, do this experience and so then I formalized it. So I take people today. We, we have groups coming every day at 365 except Sundays in the morning and afternoon. And we take them through a Feni experience. It's nothing like anybody would have seen. I also created it different so that if you've been for a wine tour, or you've been for a whiskey tour, this is going to be different. And then we take you for a food pairing and a tasting of three Feni. Cashew, a coconut and a dukshiri. And it's, got, it's paired with 23 different items that, oh, wow. that are designed to please you, to compliment you. And the most important, to confuse you. So because we, we're doing a very sensory taste, very, very different. And it's got uh, a lot of people enthusiastic. And because we know what we're doing, we almost have a 100% success rate. Everyone who comes there tastes it and likes it. We've done the SEO dinner, like it's like the G20, the Shanghai thing that they did. So we've done the SEO dinner. We've had people from Akshay Kumar coming, Twinkle Khanna coming to celebrate their birthdays. We've had Joanna Lumley come over. Whole host of different people from different walks of life coming every day. Some people are experts. Some people are not, and we don't care. We want to give you that, deliver that experience that you've never seen before. The mantra for success is not easy. It takes persistence. So you've got to do it again and again and again. And once in a while, some told me, Hansel, how long will you do this? Today has been five years. I'm doing this every day for five years. Wow. And I don't get tired. Because every because I'm not telling you a script. I just go and speak ex tempo. You can I can talk about Feni, as my wife says, till the cows come home. I can talk forever. When we spoke about Feni, right? You spoke about making money out of it. You spoke about, yes, I have to invest in this. You've taken your business, right? I believe when you had started off, your business was uh, turning around when you taken it over, around 3 lakhs turnover to a multi-crow. You've grown it to a multi-crow business. To someone who's starting off business, what advice would you have on how to scale 
with you know passion at the heart of what you do you know when i when i when i first took over the business this was in 2012 uh, and i i proposed to take over the business in 2010 i was working for a fortune 10 company and imagine telling your dad i'm going to quit i didn't say i was going to quit my job but i said i wanted to take over a 3 lakh turnover business turnover gross annual and everyone laughed from my accountant to my then uh, wife and my girlfriend she was going to be my wife and everyone was shocked they thought this is just this guy talking it was not just taking a 3 lakh business it was there were two things in my mind i was going to take a flagging part of my business and say let's build it up because i knew if i come back into the business as a boss i would need to earn my stripes so i said okay let me take a flagging part of the business and take it up but there was the other opportunity for me feni was one of this one of the fine products that came out of out of goa one of the original products that came out of goa if this was an original product and we were selling it at that time at 80 to 100 rupees that was the average price of a bottle of feni 80 to 100 rupees a bottle i said i'm going to increase the price five times and so i launched kazulo at 500 rupees and that was the challenge how do i take a 3 lakh business to a multi crore business you don't know so i told you money is never the motivator you really don't know how big it's going to become but you don't my challenge was how do i take an 80 rupee product and take it to a 500 rupee product back then and that was unthinkable it's like to give a simpler analogy is taking it's like taking a 2 rupee idli and trying to sell it at 200 rupees so that was the challenge and that is what motivated me that was completely what motivated me how do i take this very simple product the first thing i did which is actually very shocking for an indian male child is to go and kill your father's brand my father created a brand for 30 years <laughs> 30 years yeah, i was 30 years old then and uh, the first thing i did was kill my father's brand okay you know what how, what people thought people just looked at me like who is this audacious kid come on the block trying to show off kill this brand but i had to make a bold step there there were two reasons why i killed my father's brand one is to ensure that people did not get confused between the old and the new yeah that's number one the second thing was also i had to create a new living level playing field i had to show that i'm willing to amputate something if i wanted to go to the next level my father was actually very positive actually he never said it he never said a word till now he never said a word at all but we decided to kill the brand and i decided to create my own brand and put my name on it you normally put your father's name or you put your grandfather's name or something you give someone else credit for it i put my name and i remember when i told everybody at home i put my name on it i didn't put my real signature so you'll never be able to remove it or check but i just put some i put a fake signature but when i put that on the tail on the thing the first time uh, i realized there was an une- uneasiness on the table and um, but nobody said anything to me and for me that was an important statement because I was willing to stick my neck out and say that if you're going to drink a Kazulo, it's been vetted by me. And I, I, I formulated there was no rules for Feni. I had to create my own rules. And you know, the alcohol industry is very competitive. Nobody's going to share you secrets. So we created something that we called the three rules of rejection. The first rejection is when Feni comes, we reject it at the distillery. Okay. The second re- re- rejection is when it comes from the distillery to the bottling plant. There could be some agitation; it could change. And the third rejection is when it goes into the bottle. Yeah, we do three taste tests. I must tell you, the person who told me to do this was my father. He didn't give me the rules, but he very clearly told me, "Said Hansel, if you're going to make a new Fanny brand, it has to be better than the brand I created." I said, "But your product is good. I'll use the same product." And he said, "No, no, no, no. It cannot be. You have to create a product better." And that was the big thing. How do you make Fanny better? So, so I was. It's, it couldn't be old wine in a new bottle it had to be a new wine and that's when i had to really think and that is what uh, so what we we did something very simple you have to always realize when you have posed with a problem there's always a solution it depends how you well you find it and you know what the solution was going back into history what did we do and i realized my grandfather did something very simple he just kept a bottle of feni a garafa of feni resting for a year and when this was consumed we went back to that to that feni and now that was already one year old so i just rested my feni for one year so that's why the 2000 garafa That's where the two thousand garafa. So, and what actually happened was it it worked very well. If you think about it from a business point of view, I was able to secure future feni by aging it here. So, when you know it's a it's a crop that can have varies in production, it could have bumper crop or less crop. I never it fluctuates, never affects me because I've already got buffer volume in storage. So it worked out well. That was a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Another challenge. I like, this is a personal this that I have. Like when like. We as locals love you know Feni. We've know it for it. But whenever I give Feni to an outsider local, the first instant as soon as they drink it, it's a smell. Right. So what's the story that you tell? Right. To change the a strong smell into a sensuous uh, story. 
Yeah, so how like I want to convince my friends as well that okay, this is no, so, great for health. You know, besides the health benefits, it, it smells great as well. So I, I was always a very keen observer. So and if you go to a, you got to realize popular imagination is a very powerful thing. It can um, convince you irrespective of, of the truth. And what happened is your your first experience of Feni is with a taxi driver or a waiter or someone who's just given to you, and they are generally amateurs. telling you about feni giving a very subjective opinionated view of yeah. what they think of feni is but if you look at it from the other perspective the most high priced commodities around the world have polarizing smells and tastes absolutely from blue cheese which smells like puke if you if you just take yeah. it subjectively it looks like it's got fungus on on, on cheese um escargot which is a slimy snails in in france you can talk about caviar which is um fish eggs from, i mean uh, salted brined fish eggs civet coffee civet coffee yeah so these are all very polarizing products but i realized uh, all these products have a very interesting kink that make it very interesting and i realized feni has that feni has that very unique smell let's let's put it this way on, on my palm feni comes from the smallest state in india feni uh, is made from the cashew fruit not many people know what a cashew fruit is floyd couldn't describe a cashew fruit <laughs> okay it's made from a in a very unique process feni is the only product in the world that is distilled directly to drinking strength we don't cut it with water when you're drinking a feni it is 43% alcohol from the fruit and oh. 58% water from the fruit also and it is double distilled in a pot still following a recipe that is 450 years wow yeah i've also read that it's possibly one of the only six products that distilled underground in the world uh not underground or fermented underground no 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 so it fermented fermented, fermented. Yeah, yeah yeah and it's got a from a process point of view you're absolutely right we we are still following a pre industrial product procedure so when it comes to making it we're still collecting fruit by hand uh we are fermenting it in underground uh, to a process called underground natural fermentation and we distill it to a double stage distillation with a wood fire if you if you put all these things together and you have people who experience making it and this was made in france or made in europe you'd have a line 3 kilometers long people waiting to come and try this product because we don't make products in thousands of liters a normal feni distillery makes about 35 liters per still per day oh wow yeah so it's a, it's absolutely bespoke artisanal and for me i realized there was so much of value in the story why aren't we marketing it differently why aren't we telling people the story we started we when we launched feni at 80 rupees when feni was 80 rupees we launched at 500 rupees today today we've taken the ceiling to 1000 rupees and my next stage is to take feni to about a 3500 to 5000 uh, liter uh, price, price point per price point and how do we do that if i took normal feni and i uh, i took good quality feni and i kept it for a year i could make a 500 rupee premium i want to take it further how do i take a uh, i mean through normal pricing we went to 1000 rupees but how do i take it from 1000 rupees to 5000 that's the big challenge and you can do it two ways you can be gimmicky you can throw an old oak barrel everyone throws anything to an oak barrel becomes fancy or you go back into history back your research so i went back into history and i realized there was something very interesting feni was aged in three different substrates it was aged in wood it was rested underground and it was rested underwater 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 so we've we decided to take the most interesting you saw the, the the interesting underwater so we decided to take the underwater route first so 4 years ago we put 300 garafoish underwater under 10 feet of water hydrostatic pressure no sound diffused light no movement and a very stable temperature So we picked up the best feni vintage of what I op- opined is the best feni of the year. Picked it up, put it in a garage house, sealed it tight, three layers of covering, and kept it underwater on Sanjam. Wow! On day of Sanjam, we put it down underwater, ten feet. So we had to swim. Significant. Uh, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Keep it down there. And nobody really knew, knew what we were doing. We just kept it very secretly. Secretly, we put three hundred garafoish underwater and left it there for three years. Pulled out a bottle uh, two years ago, and we. uh i was very curious to see what it tastes like three old feni underwater we did a blind taste we did we done six tastings i had like my sister in law who's canadian who drinks only feni she's white canadian but she's so but drinks only feni and uh, my wife who doesn't drink feni okay. my mother drinks only urak my father drinks feni occasionally all of us are, we didn't have a kind of set of only feni drinkers or non feni drinkers we had a mixture of everyone i've done this test six times every time hands down these feni's have passed with flying colors i reckon for the first time 
we've been been able to tangibly show a marked difference and a marked improvement in the product wow, without, being like having... gimmicky, without being gimmicky without being gimmicky i just want to have a yeah yeah under, you know, I, uh, <laughs> underwater fini tonight no, the, 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 the question is it's like you want to drink underwater fini are you willing to pay that premium yes definitely yeah, yeah. so yeah, that that's yeah. the main so that's, thing so, so that's the big challenge you know so we, we were wondering if if we take it higher would people pay for it would you pay 10000 rupees for a fini if you could create one and we actually we actually going to create that again it's taken research a lot of research and i'm telling you we are on the cusp of actually we are it's going to take us 3 years to work out that product it's we are working on a 10000 rupee fini just now it's one of the most exciting projects i think it's it's going to change the world i believe alcobev is a very uh, i think socially driven uh, you know brand driven uh, market right mm-hmm. people want to hold a glass that signifies a particular social status and so i think what you're doing with that is is besides the drink is is adding to social status as well so no so it's a good question you know when i when i first started with feni people would be embarrassed what are you drinking and he's saying a feni there was one uh, i'll not name him but he said very clearly he said you're drinking a feni and he laughed and sneered at me saying i'm drinking a grey goose i was like okay good you drink a grey goose yeah but it but 10 years ago when i started uh, nobody wanted to keep a feni i couldn't get feni on any menu if you looked at any menu um, you'd have maybe 12 different options of single malts i mean even five different gins and maybe feni was feni was generally the last product on the menu and priced just above water so it was about 30 rupees a peg if you ever remember it was always 30 rupees a peg and that was a big problem you don't give people choice of feni but you can give 12 choices of, of whiskey and i said why can't i do that why couldn't i have a valpoi style feni or a or a seoli style feni or a south goa lotholi style feni why should only my be be pushed to one brand why can't i have a big boss or a casulo or a, or if it algo i could have something different why are you forcing me to drink what what you have and so these were big questions for me of of why we do selling feni different why we positioning feni different so when we opened up our bar uh, tejoro which became very uh, successful it became the number 4 bar in asia on the 50 best and we became 65 in the world what we did interestingly was we put feni on the first page of the menu you know who it, who it pissed off it didn't pissed off patron patrons it pissed off all the liquor companies for the first time i think ever a bar in goa did not put whiskey on the first page wow yeah diageos and the pernos were like what the hell is happening and we put feni on top we put five feni cocktails and we gave three different options of feni and they were all su- uh, surprised and what did we do we came to number 4 in asia we beat the bars in japan we beat the bars in singapore beijing taipei everywhere a bar from kolwa goa india was reported on cnn that became the number 4 bar in asia that came not from a major city and served an interesting brand uh, of alcohol called feni that was exactly like wow uh, we have to applaud you i think for one is <laughs> uh, taking feni you know from a 30 rupees uh, a peg to uh, 10x 10x the prices yeah, yeah. now it's about peg, 300 rupees a peg yeah. creating experiences that are uh, are uh, covered by every major media house creating restaurants that are take, that's taking goa uh, to the global uh, top restaurants of the world and what we've come across this whole podcast hansel is you're a visionary right your vision 15 years back to study the feni market and not from a business point of view how do I, not about how do i make money out of this but how do i change what feni stands for absolutely right how do i take it from something that is affordable to something that's aspirational right so a very interesting question to you how to how to craft an intoxicating vision <laughs> no sir very good question first of all you said um, yeah how do you create an intoxication vision i mean you know, sometimes vision just comes and sometimes you have you 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 never know when a vision can come and i think that's a big difference i'm a vision i mean my family now laughs at me because they know i'm a terrible businessman you come to finances <laughs> okay yeah my my finances are always a mess because uh, as a visionary you you get so taken by yourself i'm either buying garafam or i'm investing in something i planted a thousand cashew trees uh, a few months ago and you're planting the trees that is going to give you crop in four years time if there's no fire and if the crop is good you no know, sir these are these are crazy mind boggling things that accountants don't understand um uh, but, but but what you have to understand is there's a there's a goal there's a goal where i want to uh, and this is something i said prophetically a long time ago i wanted to be given enough feni goa can rule the world and i believe that i believe that if you give if feni is a 450 years old product that has stood the test of time if it could stand the to stand the test of time and fight off competition from so many spirits around the world there must have been something right about it and so it was taking this vision to the rest of the world and i it's a single minded focus and so you have to understand when it comes to creating a 
a good product, creating superior products to that. So you can create, uh, we've created a premium category. We created, I'm trying to create an ultra premium category and the 10,000 rupee fanny is going to be a prestige category. And again, these cannot be gimmicky because the world is watching you. Uh, so we're doing that. The third thing is we, we said we're going to create our own playing field. We're not going to copy anybody else. We have to be original. If Feni is an original spirit, we need to sell Feni in an original way. The, third, the, the fourth thing is creating experiences. Because today, you're actually living life as an experience. You're not living life as a module. And so I said, if you want to take this thing further, alcohol is an experience. It's a social lubricant. And I needed to make you understand if you can understand you can like it if you like it you will love fall in love with it i wanted people to fall in love with that product and so it's a multi-stage process and in the end the last thing there's so much of angst in goa people are buying up goa people are selling goa all those kind of things question is what are we doing about goa and for me that was the big thing i can always lament about feni being one of those high price commodities like indian tea and indian saffron today that cost nothing if i don't do something who am i to blame i'm a second generation feni maker so i said i have to go and do it pick up the industry by the scruff of its neck and do it uh, it's not easy it takes a lot of determination it takes a lot of support from family it takes a lot of a character to do that again and again and you know that it's not easy being an entrepreneur one thing is because there is no pathway you're creating your own path you're constantly uh, you know i was just driving the other day back and i was exhausted i was exhausted and i was thinking to myself i said why am i doing this why am i doing this i could just be sitting back and just forget it just let it happen and then you wake up the next day and you're saying okay i'm going to do 10 million <laughs> i'm going to wake up 10 million million things but it's it's one of those things that you you do day in and day out and when you look back it's that beautiful sea scenery that you see behind. And that's what you wake up for every morning. Yeah, that, That's very beautiful. Uh, thank you, Hansel, for your, some great insights on today's podcast. If you like what you're watching, please don't forget to follow, subscribe. Another question I had. Mistakes, right? With great vision come great mistakes. Yeah. Right? Can you... <laughs> Tell us how to learn from your mistakes, if you've made any. No, no, no. So I made a lot of mistakes. And one thing with mistakes, when, you, when, you, when you're an entrepreneur and by, you're by yourself, the, the buck stops with you. So it's your fault, no matter what it is. And when you tumble and you start rolling and you can, you're falling into that hole, there's really very little that can actually stop you because only you can stop yourself. Um, there were two big mistakes. One was we got smashed by COVID. We got really smashed. I mean, I, I was down and out because I, I invested in, I paid my order for bottles in December. India was totally fine in December. We were partying in Goa and uh, China was in lockdown. So I gave my money. One week later, China goes into lockdown. And the second thing after that was India goes into lockdown. And financially, all my money out there, money out in the market, I was my biggest mistake back then was not managing my finances of putting goods out in market, getting that 30 day cycle and bring that money back. That was a big thing. You how to manage your finances. You don't pay money in advance without realizing that money is not going to come back. And that really knocked the socks out of me. The second time, the second big mistake was getting distribution right. Uh, I was very, it was a very touch and go. I really didn't know if I should find a standard distributor or do it myself. Because I get a standard distributor, he'll treat it like a commodity. He really doesn't care about it. But I said, if I distributed myself, uh, I'd be actually getting out, getting it out in the right time at the, to the right people at the right places. I quickly realized I grow my own cashews. I produce my own feni. I do my own packaging. Uh, I do my own bottling. I do my own sales. I do my own marketing. And I'm doing my own distribution. Wow. And... I'm also making cocktails and pouring it. And I'm also making experiences. experiences. I spread myself too thin. Plus, I'm running another business, Vaz Enterprises. It's all sorts of integration. Yeah, yeah this, it's all integrated, but it's it's too much. I was spreading myself too Horizontal, thin. Horizontal, vertical. So after, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm a gymnast. I don't look like a gymnast, but but 10 years down, I'm, we're going to be getting a formal distributor next month. I think we're ready for that now. Because now, after my 10 years of incubation, we had five years of creating the brand, five years of marketing the brand. Now we want to sell start selling the brand and making money superb uh, mm -hmm. so guys if you like what you're hearing please do not forget to like share subscribe you spoke about goa right mm -hmm. i read a quote somewhere drink feni save goa that's your quote, <laughs> right <laughs> yes 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 yeah. uh, tell us about it how, you know, how do you intend to save goa uh, through the mission of feni yeah so so we, we were actually fighting a very tough battle at that time the industry was facing very strong headwinds and i was at a press conference and i made the statement drink feni save goa 
And I think there was a collective gasp with the whole uh, journalist fraternity. They were like, what is this guy talking, drink feigning? And people, some people laughed. A couple of newspapers carried it as a headline. And I said, this has to be the next t-shirt that I make. But actually what happened was, uh, to explain that statement, what I said was, I said, uh, what, what people, there's a big thing that we talk about today. How you do transfer of wealth from one place to the other? Today, all the tourism is built upon the coast of Goa. If they consume Feni, and Feni, what is interesting about Feni, Feni is one of the last spirit categories in the world that is still family-owned. Oh, is it? Yeah. There's no other spirit category that is family-owned. Every fa- Feni brand today is owned by a family. The Vaz family or the Hendrix family or the Bhakta family. They're all different kind of family. Haldankar families. They're all owned by families. So every time you drink a sip of Feni, it's not going to a corporate account. It's going into a family account. And we families, because we're local... We're also supporting local families in that area. And so every time you drink a kazulo in, say, Kalangud, you're actually contributing money, somebody's education in, say, in, in Bicholi or in, say, in Bali or in Kankon or in, uh, in Raya or in one of those places. So it's very interesting that the wealth that we make is actually transferred every year because we also follow a very fair priced product. The second thing is, so that's one part, wealth transfer. The second thing is every time you drink a feni means we need more feni for which we have to plant more trees. Oh, yeah, casualties, so, yeah. Yeah, we plant more casualties. So we're always talking about casualty. I mean, people cutting down forests. But if you actually create wealth, if you can take the price of Feni to a 10,000 rupee product, which is now very aspirational, we might have people wanting to get to make better Feni's that way, which is more profitable, which means we'll need more Feni, which means you have to keep the trees on your hills. And so what, what we said, if you drink Feni, you'll also keep your hills green. And that's how you will save Goa. You'll pay for someone's education, but you'll also keep your hills green. Keep Goa green and employed, right? Employed. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a great uh, vision. Talking about a vision, right? Mm. Some years ago, you actually lost vision. You were medically dead, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. For 18 minutes. 18 minutes. So in some ways, a lot of, a lot of them would call you the prophet of Feni, right? We, <laughs> uh, we'd love to know you as uh, Hansel the Sage because you've come back to life. <laughs> uh, yeah. And to yeah. save an industry that's, uh, you know, local yet uh, was dying. So tell us about that experience. Tell us, you know, what have you learned from, you know, from a near-death experience? So, so um, it was actually a death experience. So I was out, oh, out, I was out okay. for eight, I was okay. eight for eighteen minutes. So I was I was I was alive. Then I I was going through a heart attack, and then my heart stopped for eighteen minutes. Um, they were trying to revive me. They gave me three. It took three defibrillator uh, attempts to finally bring me back, and I I came back. Um, so I came back and it was it was uh, it was very traumatic for me. Uh, it was very traumatic for me to even recount the story a few years ago. But now a lot of people ask me and it's it's it, it also helps me with uh, talking about. But um, what this experience of, of being revived has taught me is that they always say life doesn't give you a second chance and life never is forgiving. Life is tough. What I realize that I realize two things. Give everyone a second chance, maybe a third. Powerful, Never a fourth. Powerful. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, had I not been given a second chance, I would have not been where I was. And the, the second thing I learned was never procrastinate. We're always leaving things for the next day. We're always thinking we'll do that. We'll I'll do that tomorrow. I'll maybe buy a present for someone today. Uh, I should buy the present today, not buy the present tomorrow. And I think that is what actually what I, what I what I realized. So if you look at my graph with Feni and life, it was a normal trajectory, always always on the upswing. But then after my heart attack, when I had that almost um, three months uh, at home, and I was supposed to stay home for a year, but I I, I revolted. I actually rebelled and I came out of, of 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 bed in three months, and I I came back to work in five months. I used to work one hour a day, but it became slowly two hours a day, three hours a day, four day, four hours a day, and after two years, I was able to work a full eight hour day. Um, but, but you realize you've got to push. You know, you really got to push and come out and fulfill what you want to do that is a big thing i said i'm never going to uh, there's no there's no half punches it's always going to be a full punch yeah wow you know so fulfill what you want to do i think that's a great message to end this amazing podcast with hansel my name is floyd tavares co-founder of Brandy consulting a brand consulting firm based out of goa and today hansel spoke about how to create a brand for the world right how to take a local authentic brand craft your vision build experiences, create the right product, test it, research it, and go all out and play the game, right? Make your, if the ground doesn't exist, make your own playground, make your own rules. And I think that's Hansel was in a a nutshell, right? So uh, (laughs) thank you, Hansel, for being on 
uh, podcast here on the Prana How to. It was an absolute pleasure. I want to go and get that sip of the ten thousand rupees fini, <laughs> the underwater fini, and yeah. So that's that's it. Thanks, thanks Thank for you, being no, on our you. podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much.